Hi guys, it's Mark Zikri, Mr. Sci-Fi, and today we are going to answer the question, is Denis Villeneuve's Dune the greatest movie ever made? Well, the answer is no, <laughs> but it's a very, very good film, and I want to get into it and talk about it in comparison with uh, the other versions of Dune, uh, and uh, so we'll get into this. I'm going to be accompanied in this journey by my dear friend Sting as Fade in uh, David Lynch's uh, wonderful... Uh, attempt to film Dune. Uh, and and for greater information about the backstory on Dune and to be able to watch the three-hour restored version of David Lynch's Dune, uh, well, I'll put a link below that'll guide you to where you need to go uh, for the various things I've been posting about Dune in the recent uh, days. So let's get right into it. I was very much looking forward to this movie. It was delayed several times because of the pandemic. I, I really thought Denis Villeneuve did an amazing job with uh, Dune 2049. It was very much in that universe. It was very hard to do, and it was not just a recapitulation of the first story. So whether you like it or not, at least he really took a deep dive, and it's, it's visually stunning. And uh, the arrival, of course, also, you know, spoke to the possibilities of him being the right guy to direct Dune. So, what can I say about it? It's visually gorgeous. It uh, might be a little bit more clear than David Lynch's version. It's a very complicated story, though. To give you the basics, without huge spoilers, this is set, kind of set up at the end. The basic gag is: Emperor is threatened that Duke Leto, the Atre Atreides' house is becoming so popular that it might ultimately uh, supplant him. And so he rem the, the, the most wealthy uh, um, um, element being mined throughout the colonized uh, universe is Melange on the planet of Arrakis, Arrakis called Dune. And uh, so he moves the Harkonnens out, puts the Atreides in with the idea the Harkonnens will then attack them. And he'll buttress the, uh, the, the uh, Baron Harkonnens troops with his own troops secretly, and no one will know that his hand was in this thing. And that's that's a basic gag. There's other bits and pieces of it, but that's, for, for the setup, that's what's going on. And under that, the indigenous population uh, who live in the desert, the Fremen, are being uh, essentially a colonized and misused people, and Zendaya is uh, one of those, and so forth. So, Let's talk about it. Visually, it's gorgeous. Uh, the visual design stuff is great. Though the one thing that never comes across is the heat of the desert. They talk about it, but you never really get a sense of the, the, the oppressiveness of it. If you want to see a film that does that in a terrifically uh, marvelous way, an inventive way, uh, watch Flight of the Phoenix, the original version starring Jimmy Stewart, not the remake. It really gets across the heat uh, and danger of the desert, and uh, so it's definitely worth checking out. And of course, if you haven't seen Lawrence for Arabia, that's another one of the great films in the desert, and clearly that is uh, an influence on Denis Villeneuve as well. Uh, and um, beyond that, of course, it's interesting that um, that, that director, David Lean, was one of the, was uh, brought aboard to uh, to make Dune into a movie early on, and that ultimately fell apart. If you go watch my previous video on that, you'll find out all the details of that. I thought it would be fun to compare, role by role, the actors in Denis Villeneuve's version, David Lynch's version, and the unmade Alejandro Jodorowsky version that came before all of them. And in terms of, but let's let's start with, in terms of visual design, Denis Villeneuve really is great. It's very clear with the Atreides, the Duke Leto, and all of that, the, the visual design of those sets clearly, and those costumes, he clearly is being influenced by David Lynch, who did, dealt with, you know, dark woods and kind of a, uh, you know, sort of a 19th century uh, aesthetic. And, uh, and so it works in both films. And, uh, and Vill Villeneuve's is the more consistently beautiful, the plot is the more consistently clear, and it has fewer silly, goofy things in it, like the, the wording modules and all that stuff. Now, the the earliest version, of course, was Alejandro Jodorowsky, where they made a documentary about the great version of Dune that he had planned in the 70s that fell apart, but the uh, the design team he assembled of H.R. Uh, Giger and Ron, um, uh, Ron Cobb and Chris Foss, Mobius, uh, that would then have enormous impact on other films, uh, all the way from Alien to Aliens to Total Recall and beyond. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of these things. Now, 
so Villeneuve's film, uh, beautiful to watch, clearer adaptation, uh, and and he's, he's wise enough to make two movies to, to cover the, the details in the book rather than one because it's a huge, vast story. Um, and uh, And yet, you don't care as much, or at least from speaking for myself, I didn't care as much about the characters, about what was happening. Somehow in David Lynch's version, for all of its flaws of wacky visual effects, etc., um, it, it, the characters come through more, more strongly, uh, particularly the supporting characters. And, uh, and his visual design sense is, is spectacular. I mean, amazing. He'll go into the grotesque every now and then, uh, but, but it's, it's really well cast. Both, both the Villeneuve and the David Lynch version are wonderfully cast, and I'm going to compare each role. And, uh, and then also, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, there's a very interesting question of it being the greatest unmade movie you can imagine. If you go online, you can find his storyboards, you can find Mobius's character sketches. Uh, the script has not quite surfaced, but, uh, but it's been out there in one way or another. So, um, but I don't know if that would, if it would have been a good movie, you know? Uh, and we'll get into his casting choices and why that might not have been uh, nearly as strong. But let's, let's start right off with uh, Paul Atreides, our hero. Now, Timothy Chalamet, uh, is in Denis Villeneuve's version, and he has an amazing lack of muscle tone. You really wonder with all the fighting and the training and all of this that he isn't more, um, uh, you know, studly, the more more muscular. He's so lean and so pale. Uh, it's, you know, you want to kick sand in his face. Uh, you know, so I, I, he's okay. He's a little wan. He doesn't seem as powerful as he might. Um, I don't think he's the ideal Paul Atreides, but, you know, he's striking and distinctive, and he's sort of the flavor of the month nowadays. Uh, interestingly enough, we saw him the next day in the French Dispatch, and he was fun in that movie. But, um, of course, in David Lynch's version, David Lynch uh, cast a guy who looked like him, uh, only younger and, and handsomer, but very much, if you look at the photos of them side by side when, when in 1984 when they made Dune, uh, it's uh, very striking, but it was Kyle McLaughlin, and he was very young, and he really hadn't quite learned to act yet, but he's extremely likable and seems very heroic. Uh, and uh, later he would get much stronger as an actor in uh, in later things, Twin Peaks and so forth. But um, but you like him in this movie. He's very likable, and so he, he's, he's, he's a good choice despite whatever flaws he might have. Now, Hodorowsky was going to cast, well, he did cast his own son, Brontus, to play Paul Atreides, cast him when he was 12, but over the course of shooting, he would have, you know, become a teenager. And he spent, like, several years getting in shape and practicing martial arts and all of this thing, these things. He was a very good-looking young man, and he probably would have been good. Uh, he, um, but sadly, we never got to see his version. Now, Baron Harkonnen, of course, is the villain. And, you know, Stellan Skarsgård, they put him in this huge fat man makeup that took some, like, 10 hours to apply. And he's a good actor, and he's kind of very downbeat and very kind of, oh, you kind of do this, do that, you know. And that works, but it kind of takes the energy down. And so, for me, I, I prefer Kenneth McMillan as, as Baron Harkonnen in David Lynch's version. He had all of Baron Harkonnen's family have red hair, including Sting. And, uh... And the costume design, by the way, is, is spectacular throughout all of David Lynch's stuff. The, the costumes in Denis Villeneuve's are very good, and the costumes in, in David Lynch's are very good. Both of them have very strong artistic sensibilities. And, and, uh, the, and the, the costume designs in Hodorowsky's, there's a documentary on it. I, I urge you to watch it. Uh, they were very strange, and I don't know if they would have worked. They were extremely colorful, extremely 1970s. He was mid mid-1970s. He was... He was doing that 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 film that never got made. But Kenneth McMillan is a big, colorful, operatic character. He's got these horrible sores, and he flies, and he's laughing, and he's, you know. And I actually really like that, because if you look at some of the crazy dictators like Hitler when he was giving speeches and so forth, some of them are downbeat and just kind of like this, but others are these big operatic characters. Look at look at Donald Trump, despite your um, what you think of him. You know, he's a big personality. And he's a performer. And I liked that in Kenneth McMillan's uh, role of Baron Harkonnen and, uh, and how David Lynch directed him. I, I find, for me, that really works and, uh, and is great fun. There's glee in it and joy and a, and a joy at winning. And uh, I really like it. So, but though, interestingly enough, in Hodorowsky's version, Orson Welles was cast as Baron Harkonnen. Now, he physically fitted. He was very, very fat. 
Uh, of course, he did Citizen Kane. He was one of the great geniuses of cinema and a very distinctive actor. But by the time we get to the 1970s, Orson Welles is just kind of walking through the roles he's being cast in. He's really not bringing it. And so, again, I don't know if Horowski's cast would have worked. It's more like stunt casting rather than... Um, casting for depth of performance and so there's no telling it might have gelled or it might not have but we wouldn't we wouldn't have known until we saw it but orson welles there are many many movies of that period where he's just he's in it he's competent but you can just tell he's kind of phoning it in. he's just taking the paycheck and putting the money into his own um film projects and uh you know not really inhabiting it he's less an actor than a personality by this point um now fade fade in does not yet appear in Denis Villeneuve's version, he will in the, probably in the next one, uh, in David Lynch's version, it was Sting, and he's really distinctive, and really, I mean, the, the outfit they put him in is, is great. At one point, he wears this blue Speedo, and he is just toned to a fare thee well. He's very impressive, and I really like his performance, too. I think he's great. I think the stunts are not as good as Villeneuve's. The stunt scenes, the, the fight scenes, are much better in Denis Villeneuve's uh, in general, but I liked Sting very much in David Lynch's uh, version, and and Hodorowsky would have cast Mick Jagger. So again, it's that same feeling of sort of a charismatic figure, a handsome charismatic figure, and uh, Mick Jagger might have been great. He at the around that time he was in movies, and he was turning in some very 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 good performances. So uh, so that probably would have worked. Now, in terms of the Emperor in Denis Villeneuve's Part One, which the first film is billed at, as you haven't you haven't seen him yet. Uh, in David Lynch film, it was Jose Farrar, who was very good as the emperor, kind of interesting and and self-serving. And I, I and Jose Farrar, of course, won an Oscar for playing Cyrano de Bergerac. If you've never seen that movie, go see it. He's terrific. And uh, but he's he's good. He's good as the emperor. I, I like him. Um, now Hodorowsky's version would have had Salvador Dali as the emperor, and he wanted a hundred thousand dollars an hour. And uh, Hodorowsky agreed to it and was going to figuring out how to shoot him for just an hour. Uh, it probably wouldn't have worked. You know, um, Salvador Dali's English was not good. Um, he was not an actor. He was a performer, you know, very much as a surrealistic painter. Again, it's stunt casting, but not uh, not really choosing the people who will deliver the greatest acting performance. So again, that it's more like a circus in terms of that casting. Uh, Lady Jessica, Rebecca Ferguson is very solid. Uh, I very much liked her in Doctor Sleep. I thought she, as Rose the Hat, she was terrific. Uh, but here she's okay, but not great, not hugely distinctive. They gave her a little, little more um, physical ability in terms of fight scenes and so forth, which is great. But she's been talking about how well they're making Jessica a stronger character. Well, she's a really strong character in the novel, and she's also a very strong character in, in David Lynch's movie. So I think they're kind of giving Frank Herbert a bad rap by saying she's sort of a, a, a character of her time. She's not a, she's not at all a, um, she's a very decisive character and a very uh, determined character and a very powerful character. So, um, so I don't agree with that, that, um, uh, um, you know, definition of her. But in, uh, in, in, in David Lynch's film, she is played by Francesca Annis, and she is terrific. She's stunningly beautiful. Her acting is very, very good. And the costumes they put her in are just Gorgeous, phenomenal, wonderful. And so between the two of them, I'd probably say that I prefer Francesca Annis. Um, Duke Leto, uh, Oscar Isaac is very good in that role. Jur Jur Jurgen Prachno was equally good in David Lynch's. They both seem like rulers, like leaders. They both seem like aristocrats. They're both fine actors. And uh, so in that one, I'd say it's about a tie. And uh, Hodorowsky was going to cast David Carradine, fresh off of Kung Fu, to, uh, to play Duke Leto. I don't think that would have been as good. He didn't. Ha he doesn't bring the gravitas. You know, he was an interesting actor, but not. But wouldn't have brought the 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 depth of personality and commitment and honor that uh, that Oscar Isaac and Jur Jurgen Prach now do. And Jurgen Prach now, of course, had just come off uh, doing Das Boot. And uh, now, as Chani, the love interest, uh, Zendaya is in. Uh, uh, Villeneuve's film, but but because it's broken into two halves, she really hasn't emerged much as a character other than just as some girl that he sees in a vision, and uh, so we we really don't know all you know. We're not sure what she's going to be like yet. She's okay, but Sean Young in uh, in David Lynch's is much more striking and beautiful, uh, but underused. There, you really needed a scene with her that would have established her bond with with Paul and who she was uh, as an individual. You never get that 
in uh, in in, the, in David Lynch's version. But R Sean Young was just fresh off of Blade Runner, and uh, and was and of course she's spectacular in that. Um, as Raban, who, who's sort of like a thuggish, um, you know, nephew of of Baron Harkonnen, I think you know Dave Bautista is much more striking than Paul L. Smith was in the role in David Lynch's. He, he really resonates more. But, uh, but Duncan Idaho, it's Jason Momoa in this film. Again, he lands much more solidly. Though he looks really needs that beard and mustache. I mean, without them, he's not nearly as uh, <clears throat> good looking, in my opinion. Just my opinion, guys. But, um, but he delivers a very memorable uh, turn. He's solid. If they continue making the films, uh, we would see that character again, that, that, that actor. Um, in, in David Lynch's film, it's, it's uh, Richard Jordan, just recently off of Logan's Run as the villain in Logan's Run. He was a terrific actor. He died way too young of a brain tumor. And, uh, but he was, uh, he's phenomenal. But in David Lynch's version, you barely see him. He just like comes and goes. And uh, so you really don't, the, one of the problems of course with Dune is there's so many characters. So it's very hard for any of them to seem uh, memorable. But, but, but uh, in the expanded three hour version, which I very strongly recommend that you see, uh, I'll have, a, I'll post a link to it. Um, you want to, um, you really want to check it out. But I love, I love Richard Jordan. I think uh, overall, I think David Lynch's cast is really, really strong. Now, then we, then we get to um, uh, Duncan Idaho. Well, we, that was Duncan Idaho. Then we get Stilgar, who's the leader of the Fremen, Javier Bardem, very solid, very memorable, very distinctive. Uh, and uh, whereas in, in uh, David Lynch's film, it was uh, the, the role was played by Everett McGill and he's almost invisible. He, he doesn't make an impression at all. Just kind of, he's in the scene, but you know, he's a weak link in the, in, in the, in the chain. Uh, but, you know, but then, but then you go to uh, Gurney Halleck. Josh Brolin is really good. He's got a great fight scene with, uh, with, with, with uh, Paul. And uh, and he really delivers it, so he's totally solid. Uh, Patrick Stewart, pre pre uh, pre Star Trek: The Next Generation, played um, Gurney in the David Lynch version. Kind of weird, kind of odd. Doesn't quite seem to know exactly who, you know who this character is. Uh, so Josh Brolin, I think, is a lot stronger. Uh, Liet Kynes. Max von Sydow in the original is a great Max von Sydow, who's so brilliant in the Seventh Seal, the Mar Bergman movies, and one of the great actors of all time. He's good in the, in uh, in David Lynch's Dune. Uh, they have a, a gender change and a race change to Sharon Duncan Brewster. That's fine. She's okay. She's, you know, she's fine. Uh, but Max von Sydow, of course, is um, perhaps a little more memorable just because it's Max von Sydow. Uh, Thufer, uh, in this version, in, in Villeneuve's, it's Stephen McKinley Henderson. He barely makes a dent. Uh, whereas Freddie Jones, the great Freddie Jones, great British character actor, he did Fellini films, he did tons of stuff, a wonderful, wonderful character actor, whom I met one time and I told him how much I loved, I, I, would t I told him that any time I saw his name in a movie, I'd want to see that movie. He plays Thufer and he is great. He has a great death scene in the full version of David Lynch's Dune, uh, the three-hour version. He is just one of the great actors and very memorable. Uh, and and so he's so I'd say he wins the Thufer contest. In in terms of uh, Dr. Yui, uh, uh, Cheng Chen plays Dr. Yui in, in Vill Villanova's version. Not that memorable. Uh, Dean Stockwell, who you can see in everything from, my God, The Twilight Zone to Battlestar Galactica, on and on, and, and of course, Quantum Leap. He's great as Dr. Yui, much, much more distinctive, much more memorable. Uh, and, uh, and so I think he's much stronger in that role. Now, in terms of um, the, the, the Reverend Mother, uh, you know, Gaius, whatever her name is, Helena, whatever it is, uh, it's Charlotte Rampling in this version. She's, of course, terrific. I love Charlotte Rampling. She's been I've I've been a fan of hers ever since Zardoz, and uh, which she would, she would make around this time, and uh, uh, she would make around the time of David David Lynch's version. She's older now, but she's very very good in that role as she as she administers a test to uh, a make or break test to Paul Atreides. But but Sean Phillips, who was phenomenal as Livia in I Claudius, the BBC version of I Claudius, is equally strong in uh, in the David Lynch version and the design of the Bene Gesserit witches, quote unquote, the Benny Jesuit order is better in David Lynch's with his high kind of balding forehead. And, and it's just, it's more striking. Uh, but still, the visual design is in, in Villeneuve's is good, nevertheless. The shout out Mapes, I can't remember even who played her in this version. Uh, she was Linda Hunt in, uh, in Lynch's and she's very, very good. She has more scenes in the full expanded version. 
of course, she, you know, um, won an Oscar for Year of Living Dangerously a little bit before this. And uh, and she's great in everything I've ever seen her in. Uh, as as Piter de Vries, David Dasmalchian is in the Villeneuve version. He also cast him previously as a as a coroner who, coroner who gets murdered in uh, Blade Runner 2049. He's a distinctive actor and a good one. But again, in the in the uh, version, David Lynch's version, it's Brad Dorif and Brad Dorif is just fabulous. He's an amazing actor. I've loved him in so many roles. And uh, if you ever have a chance to see the director's cut of Exorcist 3, it's a really good movie. And don't don't watch the the theatrical release. That's very screwed up. But the director's cut, Brad Dorif is a major leading role in it. And he is just mesmerizing. So I really like him in this movie. Um, you know, again, just really, really great. So that's David Lynch's version. Uh, Princess Irulan, uh, doesn't even appear in the Villeneuve film yet, as far as I know, but um, she'll be in the next part. But Virginia Madsen uh, played that role, uh, you know, in in David Lynch's, and um, and then of course there's Children of Dune, which shows where the story goes. The the the, the mini series of that is actually very very good, and uh, and I can recommend that as well. Uh, in terms of the score, Hans Zimmer's score is very very good, is really um, effective. Uh, but so is the David Lynch one with Toto and Brian Eno, who were of course very famous, and uh, and Hodorowsky had approached Pink Floyd, and that would have been a very interesting score as well. Uh, now now one thing that this is going toward and laying track four is uh, the first novel of Dune, the first story of Dune is very much the hero's journey. And it's about the rise of a hero and his followers and beating the bad guys and we're the good guys. That was, that's very standard. But in a way, uh, Brian, uh, you know, um, Frank Herbert was really trying to subvert that storyline because he was very concerned about the rise of charismatic leaders. He, uh, particularly in his case, he was looking at John F. Kennedy. He, he, Frank Herbert was a speech writer at various points and a political writer. And um, he was concerned that if Kennedy, if you got a leader like Kennedy with that kind of charisma and that kind of popularity, if he led you down a very, very dark road, would that be disastrous? And so what he's really positing in Dune, in the saga, is the notion of where a mess messianic leader takes his people and how it can get out of control, how it can get out of hand. And so he has, in, in so Villeneuve has Paul Atreides having visions of his hands dripping blood. And, and so he's leading it somewhere, interesting. And, uh, and I think when, when Dune Messiah came out, the second book in the Dune uh, saga, uh, it was not as popular as the first book because, or not, let's say not as critically well received because he was essentially turning the story on its head. Now, in retrospect, you can look at that and you can say, that's really interesting because he's questioning the very notion of the hero, the very notion of good guys versus bad guys. And uh, <clears throat> it's fascinating. And so, so we'll see where that leads. So overall, you know, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go see Dune again, villain, the villain of Dune. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go, I saw it in 2D on an IMAX screen. It's very effective in that size. And, uh, but now I'm going to go see it in 3D in chairs that move with the action, you know, cinema 4D. And uh, we'll see what I think of it. I'll, I'll report back. But, uh, but for now, I'll say it's an epic. It's wonderful. He put his heart and soul into it. But you're not as emotionally uh, caught up in the stories. At least I wasn't. Um, and, and many of the supporting characters do, do not register as strongly as they did. Some, some register more strongly, but many are just kind of lost in the shuffle. So uh, if you really want to have the full experience of Dune, what I would suggest is watch Hodorowsky's Dune, the documentary. Watch the full version of David Lynch's Dune, which I'll put a link to down here if I can, if, they, if, if YouTube lets me. And... Um, and then, and then uh, so watch the full three-hour David Lynch's version. Then watch... Um, the Denis Villeneuve, and then go watch the Children of Dune miniseries, and uh, you will have many hours of entertainment. <laughs> so, you know, David Lynch's film goes sort of downhill. The fight the fight scenes are not as good. The You know, he even three hours, he was, you know, bumping his head against the size of the story. Um, and yet the still suits are great. The visual design is just fabulous and uh, and was very influential because, again, he was determined not to do 
what other filmmakers were doing. He didn't want to do Star Trek. He didn't. He wanted it to look. David Lynch in 1984 wanted it to look unlike Star Wars, unlike Star Trek, and he succeeded. And Dune is a very different kind of story. And uh, and I thought in that way he was very true to um, the intent of, intent of the author and came up with something really unique and uniquely his own. So uh, it was. He was. He is. A, he is a giant of a director and a, and a unique. Uh, artistic personality and designer and uh so you'll you could do a lot worse than watch that film yeah but just knowing that it's uh you know not entirely successful but but where it succeeds it succeeds like crazy in that case you might want to watch the three hour version uh that i'll post a link to if i can and also of course my hour-long uh video i did previously where i talk about the development of dune which is fascinating and um i'll, I'll put a link to that down here too and um and then finally, you know, if you want to see David Lynch's film in all of its gl visual glory, uh, then get the 4K version, which has just come out recently because that's it, it just stunningly beautiful. So that's it for now. Uh, go to uh, if you want to support Mr. Sci-Fi, you can buy Space Command shares for seventy five hundred bucks, or you can go to uh, Patreon.com backslash Mark Zickry to support Mr. Sci-Fi, or you can go to TwilightZoneCommentaries.com uh, to get one hundred and four commentaries of Twilight Zone episodes that I'm going to be doing. So that's about it. So from me and my little friend Sting, Fade Rafa, we say, uh, you know, fear is the mind killer. <laughs> <laughs> and other like like homilies so that's it for now we'll talk to you again real soon bye guys take care